Yes. Uh huh. We're asking for a repair. Let me find my notes. Oh, yes. Being in Egypt. Right. Just that line? Yeah. The first time, did I say it twice? You said, well, you said 400, but later, right? Okay, is it, so it's not the time. It must not have been in my notes. Well, the very beginning, I don't have 40 in my notes. I don't have 400. But I'm saying it's, I don't have any of that in my notes, so it was ad lib, apparently. Okay, let me just say they had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They had been 40 years, plus 360. <laughs> I just want to see if you were listening. <sighs> okay, let me just give you that line, and hopefully it can be patched in there. Can I just say the line? Okay. Are they recording? Slate for the second program or for slate for this? Okay. They had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Let me give you a couple takes because I don't know how I was saying it there. They had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Will that do it? Okay. Now, just the audio, right? Great. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Who remembers what fairy tale those words come from? Snow White. Snow White. Fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm, first published in 1812. There are various versions and translations of that fairy tale I've discovered, but the gist of it is, for those who may not remember, that the queen gives birth to a daughter named Snow White. She's named for her pale white skin. And then the queen dies when the child is born. And about a year later, the king marries another woman. This queen is beautiful, but she is, according to the fairy tale, proud and overbearing. And she can't stand the idea of anyone being more beautiful than she is. So every morning she stands and looks at herself in this magic mirror and says, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? who's the most beautiful of all. And the glass assures her, you, O oh queen, are the fairest in the land. Well, the queen is happy because she knows that the mirror is telling her the truth. She is the most beautiful woman in the land. Well, Snow White, her stepdaughter, grows up and becomes more and more beautiful, even more beautiful than her vain stepmother, the queen. And so one day the queen asks her mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who in the 
mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest, the most beautiful of all? This time, the mirror responds, still speaking the truth, O queen, Snow White is the fairest of them all. Well, the queen becomes green with envy, and her heart is filled with hatred for the girl, and she sets out to have the child killed so that no one in the land will be more beautiful than she. It's actually kind of a gruesome ending to this fairy tale. It's not a really pretty story at all. Remember, it is a fairy tale. It portrays a worldly ideal of beauty, not a true view of beauty. And of course, mirrors don't talk. Or do they? Studies show that we women spend a lot of time listening to what our mirrors tell us. Let me just reset for a moment. If you were not with us yesterday, we're looking at a fairly obscure verse in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8. It's parked right there, and the, it's set right there in the middle of this lengthy passage about the children of Israel building a tabernacle for the presence of the Lord. And they, they took an offering, they brought their contributions, things they had uh, taken from the Egyptians when they, things the Egyptians had given to them when they told them to get out of the country, and uh, they had taken these items with them over the Red Sea crossing and into the wilderness, and then they brought them as offerings, voluntary offerings to give to the Lord to be used for the making of this tabernacle. And we see in Exodus 38, verse 8, that the basin, this, this laver, this bronze basin and its stand were made from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered or served in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And we talked yesterday about what this laver was, this bronze basin, and, uh, and who these ministering women were. But today I want to focus our attention on, on this whole idea of mirrors. Now, this word in the Hebrew here is from a root word that means to see. Some older translations say these were looking glasses. But this was before the invention of looking glasses and glass mirrors as we know them today. Those were not widely used until about the 1500s. So these old time mirrors were not made out of glass, but they were polished bronze plates, polished so that you could see a reflection. Some years ago, an English professor at Caltech researched the history of looking glasses in literature. And she published her findings on women, mirrors, and identity. She concluded that, quote, there's an intimate relationship between women and mirrors. She said a woman carries on a lifelong interrogation with her reflection. Am I right? Was she right? She also pointed out that in John Milton's epic Paradise Lost, Eve's first act after being created before she saw another human face, including that of Adam, her first act in this poem was to lean down to look at her reflection in a clear, smooth lake. And this researcher concluded, I think we are all daughters of Eve. Now, of course, Milton's account is an apocryphal one. The scripture, that's not in the scripture. But I think it's not far from the mark when it comes to analyzing human nature. Studies show that women look at themselves in the mirror far more often than men do. In fact, let me just ask, how many of you here in the room with us have a mirror of some sort with you? How many have a mirror? I'm going to see them. Take them out. Find it in your purse. Dig quick. Hold it up. I want to see these mirrors. Yeah, you can count a phone. Let me see your mirrors. There's a mirror. There's a compact. There's a compact. Mirror, lots and lots of mirrors, reflections, right? Now, you don't even have to have a mirror. You can, we can catch our reflection. By the way, let me say, how many of the guys in the room have mirrors on you? <laughs> That's what I thought. I don't see, you, know, you don't have a mirror in your pocket, Mike? No. Sweetheart, you don't have a, you use your wife's? <laughs> okay, listen, we don't even have to have a mirror. We can catch our reflection in a store window or other people's glasses, and they think you're just looking in their eyes, but you're looking at yourself, or a smartphone screen. I often will use this for applying lipstick. Yeah, it works for that. There was a study conducted by a British skincare company that polled 2,000 women. 
And it showed that on average, women check their reflections around eight times a day. I actually think that number seems kind of low, but I don't know. That was what they came up with, whether it was in a mirror or another surface. One in 10 of the women surveyed admitted that they can't walk past a car without looking to check their hair or their makeup in the glass. The same number, one in 10, said that they use their compact mirror at least 10 times a day at work, usually for touching up their hair or makeup. Half of the women said that they won't leave home without a mirror in their purse. And that's about what it was here in the room when I asked you a few minutes ago. At least half have a mirror with you. We're always looking at ourselves. Yet interestingly, three quarters of the women who participated in this survey said that they hate looking in the mirror. And nearly 40% said that it negatively affected their self-confidence when they do look in the mirror. So why do we keep looking? Why are we so driven to see our own reflection? Well, there's some, a lot of reasons for that. Some of those are heart issues. Some of those are cultural issues. I think as women, we feel some social pressure uh, because people pay more attention to how women look than how men look. When the president and the first lady travel, people are not usually commenting on what the president wears, but they are invariably commenting on what the first lady wears and how her accessories. And I feel this at conferences or when I have to be on the platform, I think people don't care at all what men wear, but women are scrutinizing women and looking, there's some pressure there, am I right? It's a feeling of self-consciousness. And then there's a pressure that's created by this constant exposure to unrealistic, Photoshopped images of beauty. I read somewhere uh, while I was preparing for this that the average woman today will see, um, let me how, I, I don't want to quote that wrong. I didn't write it down. Um, I, I'm not going to say it because I don't have it quite right. So we have these unrealistic Photoshopped images of beauty. We see them in the media. We see them in the media, on TV, on billboards, fashion magazines. And this image, which our mothers and our grandmothers saw much less of, this image that's set before us constantly today is, get this, impossible to attain. It's impossible. This study said, one, uh, one writer said, the current media ideal of thinness for women is achievable by less than 5% of the female population. No matter how much you may starve yourself or diet or exercise, you cannot look that way. And in fact, many of the women who you think look that way, in fact, don't actually look that way because the pictures have been photoshopped. So we have a tendency to compare ourselves to the standard of beauty that's being promoted by the world. And what does that result in? Discontent, dissatisfaction with our own appearance. We're deeply insecure when it comes down to it. We compare ourselves to others, whether others that we see in the media or others sitting in this room. Or, um, and I don't think that men do this in quite the same way, certainly not as it relates to physical characteristics. In fact, there are interesting studies about how men see themselves very differently in mirrors than women see themselves. Women see themselves much more critically in, when they look in a mirror than men see themselves. So we're insecure. We compare ourselves to others. We have this desire to measure up to be affirmed, to be attractive, to be valued. So we're constantly looking in a mirror to see how we look compared to someone else, their hair, their clothing styles, their coolness, their thinness, their whatever. And when it comes down to it, some of that is just plain old vanity, conceit, pride in our appearance, excessive concern about how we look. Now, as with all things, there's a balance here because scripture doesn't suggest that there should be no concern with how we look. If you are married, I would say it matters that you care about how you look for your husband and that you take some concern. But there's this line, and only the Spirit, I think, can help us know where it's over the line of excessive self-obsession with how we look. There's a word you've heard called narcissism. There's a word you've heard that I think explains a lot of this. It's narcissism. A narcissist, according to the dictionary, is a person who has an excessive interest in or admiration of themselves. 
an inordinate fascination with oneself, excessive self-love. Where did that word come from? Well, it came from a character in Greek mythology, Narcissus. And uh, there are variations on this story as I looked it up. Uh, but the essence is that he was a hunter who was known for his beauty. But he was also proud. And he was disdainful of anyone who loved him. Well, one day he was walking by a spring of water and he stooped down to get a drink. And he saw his own reflection in the mirror. And he fell in love with it. He wouldn't let anybody else love him. He couldn't love others, but he saw his own reflection and he fell in love with it. At first, he didn't realize it was just a reflection. And when he did, he became dejected that his love could not become fulfilled. And so he pined away until he died, or as some versions tell it, until he killed himself. Listen, obsession with self leads inevitably to either self-love or another version of self-love, which is self-loathing. Either is dangerous, and either can be deadly. Now, I want to broaden our consideration here to say we're not just talking about literal mirrors or looking glasses, but there are other mirrors that we use to assess our worth, our value, and our beauty. For example, photos. When you see a photo, a group photo, and you were in the group, and then you see the photo, who's, who do you look at? Is it just me? <laughs> you look at yourself? You want to see how you looked in that photo? Because while we're standing there with the picture being taken, we can't tell is something askew, is something awry, is our hair windblown? But when we look at the photo, it's a mirror. And it tells us how we looked, and we care about that. I, uh, my husband and I attended a wedding recently, and I've been seeing some of those pictures on Facebook that people have been sharing, and I will confess that the first person I look at in those photos is not the bride, it's not the bride's mother, it's not the bride's um, dad, it's not the bride's maids, it's me. And invariably then, there's this sense of comparison, evaluating hair and weight and wardrobe. It's a mirror that can allow me to become obsessively self-focused. It's deadly. Here's another mirror that speaks to a lot of us, and it's the scale. The scales that we, each time we step on, tell us how we measure up and then determine. You lost a pound, you gained a pound, you lost a pound, you're ecstatic, you gained a pound, you're depressed. It wrecks your whole day. It's a mirror, and it's talking to us, and it's telling us something we think about our value or our worth or our beauty. It's deadly. It can be dangerous. It's dangerous. It can be deadly. Here's another mirror. A lot of us let talk to us way too much, and that's the opinions of others, parents, siblings, our mate, our children, co-workers, friends, what people say to us, what they say about us, what we hear that they said about us, what they text, what we come across that they didn't know that we heard, but it comes back to us. And those things can haunt us. Am I right? Those are mirrors. They talk to us and they say, you're worth less or you're worth more. They can ex um, expand our worth of ourselves or decrease our sense. They can expand or decrease our sense of our worth or our value. Here's another one, social media. It's a mirror. And so likes and followers and shares on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, these we think are a, ref these are a reflection of what others think of us, how much they think of us. So some of us are constantly checking, constantly looking in the mirror because this makes us feel good or makes us feel bad. It determines how we feel about ourselves. Here's another mirror, positions or titles or our paycheck at work. Um, this is a mirror for men sometimes more than for women who are maybe more driven to care about how they do at work, but we care about how we're valued at work, how we're viewed. It's a mirror. Moms, here's another mirror. Your kids, how well behaved they are, how successful they are, their academic achievements, their accomplishments in sports, what college they get into, or conversely, their failures, their poor behavior. Moms can easily feel this is a mirror that reflects on me, and it can be encouraging or it can be embarrassing. These are mirrors that talk to us. The question is, how much do we look to those mirrors 
to tell us who we are, what we're worth, what our value is. You see, at the end of the day, no matter how beautiful, how winsome, how likable, how successful we are, or how well-mannered and accomplished your children or grandchildren may be, these mirrors are empty. They are vain. They are futile. They are fleeting. They are changing. And they don't satisfy. Oh, they may for a moment. But just as quickly as you gained a pound, but just as quickly as you lost a pound and you were ecstatic, you can gain a pound and be depressed. They change. They don't satisfy. Proverbs 31, 30 hints at this when it says to us, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. It's empty. It doesn't last. It doesn't tell us our true worth. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's a whole different focus. You see, there there are two kinds of focus here. There's a woman who focuses on her charm, her beauty, her natural, physical, or personality traits or characteristics, or those of her children, the opinions of others. She's focused on herself. And it says that's empty. It's fleeting. It's vain. It's futile. But a woman who fears the Lord, a woman who fixes her eyes on God, a woman who lives in constantly thinking about him rather than about herself is a woman who will be encouraged, she will be praised, she will be lifted up. She is a virtuous woman. Scripture talks in the New Testament about the foolishness of comparing ourselves to others, these human mirrors. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It's foolish to compare ourselves to others. Yes, somebody else has gorgeous hair. Somebody else has, you know, very stylish and up-to-date clothing. Someone else has this great outgoing personality. Somebody else has these amazing children who never do anything wrong. At least on Facebook, that's what you would think. And we compare. Comparing ourselves, measuring ourselves by ourselves, that is foolish. It is not wise. We're listening to the wrong mirrors. Scripture teaches us that communion with God, lingering in his presence, brings a new holy obsession. Not a self-obsession, but a God-consciousness and a freedom from self-consciousness. See, we're not talking about that we should just think less of ourselves or that we should think poorly of ourselves. We're saying we ought not to matter to ourselves. We matter to God, but God is what and who ought to matter supremely to us. You see this illustrated in Exodus 34, verse 29, where it says that as Moses came down from the mountain, where he had just spent 40 days and nights in the presence of the Lord, he did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. He didn't have a mirror. The people could see it. He couldn't see it because he wasn't looking at himself. He was looking at God. And God gave him this radiance and this beauty, and he didn't know it. Wouldn't that be bliss to know that your life radiates and reflects the glory of God, but you don't see it? The other people around you do, but you're not always looking. Do they see it? Do they see it? Is it there? Do I have that glory on me? Am I radiating? Am I looking like a good, beautiful Christian woman? Forget it. Think about him. You linger in his presence. You focus on him. You reflect his beauty through you, and you will be beautiful in the ways that matter. Moses' face reflected the glory of God. It's not in looking at ourselves, contemplating ourselves, fixating on ourselves, obsessing about ourselves, that we become more beautiful. But it's in looking to Christ that we develop one holy, divine obsession. As we look at him instead of ourselves, we will reflect his glory. There's a verse in Psalm 34 that I often think about as I'm getting ready to go into a photo shoot. Our team will tell you it's not my favorite thing at all to get in front of a camera. And I can become so self-obsessed. But I love this verse in Psalm 34, and I often quote it when I'm sitting there with cameras snapping and um, people, you know, say we need this for Facebook or we need this for that. Psalm 34, 5 says, those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. 
We don't get that by fixating on ourselves, but by fixing our eyes on Christ. And you see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all, with unveiled face, this is in the context of talking about Moses, whose face shone with the glory of God. But it says it wasn't just for Moses, it's for us too. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Not seeing ourselves, seeing him. We are being transformed, transfigured, metamorphosized. Is that a word? metamorphosed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Did you get that? As we gaze on him, as we contemplate him, as we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed from the inside out, not just our outward appearance, because that's all this mirror can capture is the outward appearance. It can't tell you anything about my heart. But the glory of the Lord, the beauty of Christ will transform us from the inside out. So we have beautiful hearts, radiant faces that reflect the glory of God. It's a process. We're being transformed from glory to glory to glory. It's a lifelong process by the power of his Holy Spirit. So I love that old gospel chorus. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me all his wonderful passion and purity. O thou Savior divine, all my being refine, till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. James 1 tells us that the word of God is like a mirror. It shows us the truth about ourselves. This is a mirror you ought to be looking into. And it shows us Christ, and it transforms us. So Exodus 38, 8, he made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered or served in the entrance of the tent of meeting. A mirror is anything that we use to focus more intently on ourselves. So my question is, are we going to hold on to our earthly human mirrors? Are we going to make much of them? Are we going to be using them perpetually? Or will we choose, so to speak, to give them up? That doesn't mean you never look at your face in the mirror. But it means that our obsession is not with ourselves, but with Christ. Will we give them up for Christ's sake, for the sake of the house that he is building, so others can see his glory, be washed by the labor of his grace? Let's pray. Your word says, Lord, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him, to you, be glory forever and ever. And so, Lord, so, Lord, we pray that you would um, check our hearts, speak to our hearts about the mirrors. What are the mirrors saying to us? What are we listening to? What mirrors are we using? What mirrors are we turning to? to get our sense of our value and our worth and our well-being. And Lord, may our fixation, our, our obsession be not with ourselves, but with Christ, with your glory, with your beauty. And then let your beauty be seen in us, through us, that the world may look at us and not see us, but be enamored of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, we have one repair they're telling me. Yes. If you could um, say that he, he bent down, he stooped down to get a drink of water and saw his reflection in the water. Okay. Oh, sorry, thank you. Good ears. Do we need to reslate that or we're still recording? We're still recording. Okay. One day he was walking by a spring of water and he stooped down to get a drink. He saw his own reflection. When he did, he saw his own reflection in the water and he fell in love with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. It's 1030.